Today, we're gonna to take a look at how much your performance really changes with density altitude and whether it's actually worth getting up early to get that little bit of cooler air in the morning. So a few days ago, we asked you what your biggest challenges are to summer flying. And we got three answers back that make a lot of sense. Number one, density altitude. Number two, thunderstorms. And then number three, planning for higher density altitude and thunderstorms. And we thought we'd start by covering DA. Now, if you've been following Bold Method for the last year, you know that we've been putting out short videos every day, both on our website and on our iOS app. And now we're gonna start putting out some longer form content too. And we thought that DA was a great place to start. And we're also starting this with the beginning of our summer 2024 sale. All of our courses are on sale 20% off on the website and on our iOS app. Buy them in either place and you can use them in both. So as I said, we're gonna start with DA because that was the first thing that we heard about when we talk about these summer challenges. And I asked Colin, is this something that we're just frustrated with or is there something that we can really teach about DA that you may not already know? Most pilots, at least by the time they're certified, can define density altitude and tell you roughly what it is. But when we asked around, I would say the one big question that we hear is, how much is my performance really gonna change as that density altitude increases? And then we've all been told that especially when you're flying in a high density altitude environment, like the mountains or the high plains or the desert, the middle of the summer, it really pays to get up early, take off early when the air is cool. The challenge is that's usually right around sunrise when you get those coldest temps. For us, that's pretty close to 6.30 in the morning, which is a little bit early for me. So does it really make that much of a difference if you get up and you fly in the morning versus flying at something like two in the afternoon? We're gonna look at two examples and we're gonna start out on the Appalachians in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Gatlinburg's on the west side of the Appalachians, and it's an airport that you could easily get into in that Piper Warrior, the 182, the SR-22, or the SR-22 Turbo. So for this example, we looked at both a 6.30 a.m. departure, which had a 64 Fahrenheit or 18 degrees Celsius temperature, and an afternoon departure at 83 degrees Fahrenheit or 28 degrees Celsius. And that gave us two fairly different density altitudes. In the morning, the density altitude in Gatlinburg would have been 1437. On the other hand, in the afternoon, the density altitude would be 2637. So if you look at the difference there between the morning and the afternoon, the density altitude changed by about 1200 feet. So we'll start by looking at our takeoff performance. And honestly, what you see here is exactly what you'd expect. We've got the Warrior in the bottom, the 182, the normally aspirated SR-22, all three of these are normally aspirated non-turbocharged aircraft, and then the turbocharged aircraft at the top. The blue bar is our 6.30 a.m. departures takeoff performance, and the orange bar would be the afternoon takeoff performance. And you'll notice the difference isn't massive. In the turbocharged aircraft, there's some difference, but not much. As we look at the non-turbocharged aircraft, that difference definitely grows. But honestly, for the 182, the Piper Warrior, and the normally aspirated SR-22, all three of those distances increase by about 115%. In the Warrior, the increase in the afternoon was 116%. In the 182, it was 113%. And then the SR-22, it was 107%. So honestly, that's not a huge increase. And if you look at the feet, 300 feet longer takeoff performance in the Warrior, 225 feet in the 182, and around 300 feet longer takeoff performance in the afternoon in the SR-22. And as I said, the turbocharged version, you still see a little bit of a performance penalty, but it's even smaller. The increase is about 107% we add about 152 feet onto our takeoff performance. So when you think about the available runways that you've got at these airports, honestly, that extra maybe 300 feet at the most probably still allows you to take off and depart from the airport. 
as long as you look at the runway lengths and make sure you take off at the beginning of the runway and not an intersection in Gatlinburg, that difference between the morning and the afternoon probably really will not impact your decision to take off. Now let's take a look at our climb performance. And both, you need to consider the climb performance you're going to receive right off of takeoff and then the climb performance that you're going to receive once you get to your top of climb as you're leveling off at your cruise altitude. But to kind of keep things brief and simple, we're just going to focus on that top of climb. And we're going to imagine that we are flying east today out of Gatlinburg, headed back maybe towards the east coast. And if you look at the mountains there in the Appalachians, I would say about the lowest generally usable eastbound altitude is going to be around 7,500 feet MSL for a VFR operation. So for the sake of simplicity, let's say we want to climb from Gatlinburg up to 7,500 feet MSL. What's going to be the difference between the morning and the afternoon in our climb performance? And let's specifically look at that performance right as we reach our top of climb. And what you see here is, I would say, exactly what you would expect. We've got, again, our morning in blue, our afternoon climb performance at our top of climb at 7,500 feet MSL in orange. And the difference in the normally aspirated aircraft, it's fairly noticeable. In the turbocharged aircraft, it's fairly small. The biggest performance penalty you'll see is in the Piper Warrior, where our afternoon climb performance is only about 76% of our morning climb performance. Now, honestly, that doesn't make a huge difference in that airplane because it takes a 16 minute climb from the airport up to 7,500 feet MSL and turns it into 18 minutes. Not a big change. When you look at the 182 and the SR22, as I said, that performance penalty is even smaller. Our afternoon climb performance is about 90% of our morning climb performance and only makes maybe a minute difference in that short climb from the surface up to 7,500 feet. So when you look at just the simple numbers departing out of Gatlinburg for both climb performance and takeoff performance over a 50 foot obstacle from the Piper Warrior all the way up through the SR-22 Turbo, is there a huge advantage to leave in the morning? Not on paper. Okay, now let's take a look at another example this time we're going to go to somewhere that's a little bit higher in field elevation and definitely a different climate. This is Grand Junction, Colorado, on the western slopes of the Rocky Mountains, and the field sits at 4,861 feet above sea level. But it's a completely different climate than you'd find in Gatlinburg. A lot drier. It's essentially a large desert valley. But this is still an airport where you would see a Piper Warrior, an SR-22, a Cessna 182, and of course, we fly there in our SR-22 Turbo. So it's another good example. So again, let's take a look at the morning and a typical afternoon, and we're going to compare our takeoff performance and our climb rate. Let's start by looking at our takeoff distance. Again, blue in the morning and orange in the afternoon. And if you look at the temperatures we're using, you're going to notice there's a little wider gap here. In the morning, we're using a fairly typical temperature of 67 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 19 Celsius. And that gives us a density altitude of 6,328 feet. And then in the afternoon, we're going to use 97 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 36 degrees Celsius. And that gives us a density altitude of 8,368 feet. So between morning and mid-afternoon, we're adding about 2,000 feet of density altitude. When we look at our takeoff distance, again, this makes total sense, but you see some larger penalties, which makes sense because we've got a larger gap in temperature. As I said, the Warrior has a fairly large penalty. The afternoon takeoff performance is about 117% of the morning takeoff performance and adds about 523 feet. The 182, the afternoon performance is about 115% of the morning performance, adding about 380 feet. The SR-22's afternoon performance is also about 115% of the morning's performance, adding about 500 feet. And then the SR-22 Turbo's afternoon performance is about 110% of the morning performance, adding about 250 feet. So when you look at that, 
Adding between 250 and maybe 500, a little more feet in the afternoon, doesn't make a massive change in your takeoff performance planning. And in fact, when you look at Grand Junction's runways, that's not going to be a problem for one of our single engine pistons here. Now let's take a look at the climb performance. And again, we're considering a climb from the ground up to an in route altitude. And I'm using about the lowest in route altitude that you could practically fly if you're flying somewhere out of Grand Junction, Colorado. In this case, we're gonna use 8,500 feet MSL, which would be an acceptable altitude if you're flying out of the valley and then down to the Southwest, like maybe headed towards Las Vegas, Nevada. Now, practically in the summer, flying through the desert at 8,500 feet MSL here would be the worst experience ever. Between the temperatures and the thermals, I don't think you would make it very far, but you're not gonna hit anything at 8,500 feet MSL and it would be a legal and technically safe cruise altitude for quite a few flights. So it gives us a good baseline. And again, we're comparing our top of climb performance in the morning and in the afternoon. The morning where our temperature was 67 Fahrenheit, the afternoon where it's 97. And you can see a massive difference in climb performance here for the Piper Warrior and a fairly good difference between the SR22 and the 182 and a small change in the SR22 Turbo. The Warrior's morning top of climb performance was about 150 feet a minute. In the afternoon, that's gone down to about 50 feet a minute. So we've got about 33% of our morning climb performance. And if you look at our time to climb, in the morning, it takes us about 15 minutes. In the afternoon, it would take us 26. So here you see a significant change. When you look at both the Cessna 182 and the Cirrus SR22, both of them have about 80 to maybe 83% of their morning climb performance in the afternoon. In the Cessna 182, the climb performance goes from about 475 feet per minute to about 380. And in the SR22, it goes from about 680 feet per minute to about 560. And both of those make very little difference to the time it takes us to climb from the surface up to that 8,500 foot cruising altitude. And in the SR22 Turbo, as expected, we have a tiny change in climb performance between the morning and the afternoon. Our morning climb performance is about 1,070 feet per minute. In the afternoon, it drops to about 1,050, about 98%, and essentially no change in our top of climb time calculation. So again, looking at this on paper, we do take a performance penalty on our top of climb and our overall climb performance in all of the aircraft, most noticeably in our normally aspirated aircraft. But the only one with a significant hit is the Piper Warrior, where our afternoon climb performance is about 33% of our morning climb performance. And you can see we're very close to the Warrior's service ceiling, where the aircraft can climb at 100 feet per minute. So when you're close to the aircraft's service ceiling, or you could just simply say it's ceiling, changes in density altitude will result in large changes in climb performance. And that can make a massive difference in your time to climb to altitude. But on the other hand, when you're fairly far away from the aircraft's service ceiling, then those changes in density altitude will definitely affect your climb performance but it's not going to give you a massive difference on paper. But it does actually when you look at it practically. So our client performance information and our takeoff performance all come from our pilot operating handbooks or aircraft flight manuals. But there's a couple things that they assume. Number one, that the aircraft's engine is operating in essentially light new condition. Number two, that the engine is properly leaned. Number three, that you're maintaining a set airspeed. So for the Piper Warrior and the Cessna 182, that performance calculation used VY. In the SR22 and the SR22 Turbo, both of those aircraft can't typically climb at VY for extended periods of time without getting the engine fairly hot. So that climb performance uses our in-route rate of climb and 120 knots indicated airspeed. Either case, all of those performance calculations 
assume that you are maintaining a specific airspeed and that the air is smooth. So let's focus on airspeed because when you're flying an airplane, especially a high performance airplane, airspeed is gonna be the one big thing that you control in every airplane that can cool the engine. And when we're talking about high density altitudes on hot days, cooling is a massive, massive issue. In fact, when I'm thinking about the SR22 or the SR22 Turbo taking off out of somewhere like Grand Junction in the afternoon, there is no way that I am going to be able to maintain that published 120 knot climb speed without overheating the engine. Instead, I'm gonna to need to cool it by increasing airspeed. And that means as I bring the nose down, and oftentimes for us, it's going from 120 knots to 130 knots indicated, maybe 135, I'm gonna lose a couple hundred feet per minute off of that climb rate. So that's a penalty that does not show up anywhere on paper. And then that decrease in climb rate is gonna further impact my time to climb, which means I'm running the engine hot for a longer period of time. Now, on the other hand, if I was to take off at 6.30 in the morning, where that outside air temperature was about 67 degrees, now that feels for us like fall, where I have no problem keeping even a turbocharged engine cool because that outside air temperature is so much lower. And of course, you got the swamp factor too. It is definitely a lot more comfortable sitting in the cockpit at 67 degrees than at 97 degrees. Okay, so this does bring up two other big questions. And I would say one of the biggest ones we get is how should you change your takeoff and landing technique when you're flying at high density altitude? The second one, is that why does Grand Junction or a place like Sacramento, California have so much larger temperature swings between the morning and the afternoon than somewhere like Gallenberg or St. Louis, Missouri? We're gonna take a look at both of those, but each in different videos. Don't forget, we still have the sale going on all the way through Thursday, both on boldmethod.com and on our iOS app. And let me know what you thought of this video and what you'd like us to cover in other videos. Either send that to questions at boldmethod.com or tell us in the comments down below.